Fighting along the causeway had been terrific for the last 40 hours, and words are inadequate to express all the difficulties that had to be surmounted to make an advance along the 2,000-yard narrow causeway. On October 31st, 1944, Guy Simmons, temporary commander of 1st Canadian Army, gave the go-ahead for Operation Infatuate. The amphibious landings on Wilkern Island to clear the last German positions blocking access to the Scheldt River that led up to Antwerp, which was to be the main port of the advance into Germany. This operation was scheduled to start on November 1st, 1944. In order to distract the Germans from the main attack at Vlissingen, known to many as Flushing, the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division was tasked with attacking Welkern from South Baveland. The 5th Canadian Infantry Brigade, comprised of the Black Watch of Canada, Le Regiment de la Maisonneuve, both from Montreal, and the Calgary Highlanders, was tasked with establishing a bridgehead on the island that would be handed over to the British 157th Brigade to continue the attack into Welkern as the seaborne landings took place. The attack itself was going to involve all three battalions of the 5th Brigade. They faced German troops of the 2nd Battalion, 1019 Grenadier Regiment, 70th Infantry Division. The original plan called for the Calgarys to land on the island, being carried by stormboats and LVTs. The Maisonneuve was to follow up the Calgarys. Prior to all of this, the Black Watch was to conduct what was hoped to be a quick operation to capture the causeway itself. However, this whole operation was far from quick. The causeway and its surrounding terrain was one of the major reasons why this operation took so long. The causeway was an earthen dam over a kilometer long, but less than 40 to 60 meters wide, depending on the location. The causeway was straight. On the right side, there was a railroad embankment sitting just a few meters above the waterline. A two-lane highway ran down the middle, with a cycle path and a row of trees on the left. All of this was bordered by impassable marshes of mud and water. Two-thirds of the way down, a deep water-filled crater barred the road to armor vehicles. Of course, the Canadians didn't know this until the attack began. The German defensive positions were well prepared, with a stronghold on the western end of the causeway, centered around a number of four-barrel 20mm guns and a dug-in tank firing straight down the road. Some accounts also include an anti-tank gun in the defenses. Heavy mortars and artillery guns were well zeroed in on the causeway. Barbed wire, mangled by the shelling from both sides, covered the entire area. Late on the morning of October 31st, the Black Watch was the first battalion ordered forward. C Company was to lead the advance, supported by an artillery barrage. The rest of the companies were to follow. The Black Watch's war diary recorded what happened next. As soon as the leading company approached the causeway, the enemy went into action and started dropping shells and mortar on our end of it. At 13.45 hours, our carrier's call for artillery support as C Company was held up by snipers, one machine gun, mortaring and shelling. Under this support, the lead company continued to advance and at 14.50 reported that they were within 75 yards of the far bank and under heavy mortar fire. Later developed that only one section had been successful in reaching this point, and the remainder of the platoon and the company being pinned down. Different accounts give different distances where the Black Watch was pinned down by the German fire. Some give 25 meters, others give 300 meters of them being short at the end of the causeway. The entire battalion was spread out along the causeway, hence the different distances recorded. A C Company could no longer advance, they began to dig in, and all the other companies did the same. The war diary further recorded the enemy was firing at least one heavy gun, the shells of which raised plumes of water 200 feet high when they fell short. He was also ricocheting AP, that is armor-piercing shells, down the causeway, which was hard on the morale of the men. During the attack, the extent of the deep crater on the causeway was discovered. This crater had been blown by German engineers as an anti-tank obstacle and did stop any Canadian armor from crossing it. This crater was later utilized by the Canadians during the several attacks as a company command post as the battle developed. Germans continued to shell the members of the Black Watch dug in along the causeway. It was recorded that shells were landing as close as three feet but caused no casualties as they were dug in. The jeeps evacuating the wounded were having a difficult time as the roads were coming under heavy mortar fire in behind the causeway. Engineers were able to move up and get a look at the damage to the causeway and estimated that it would take eight hours to fill in or bridge the craters. This was not done until much later. At this point, the overall plan for the attack on the causeway had changed. The plans for a water crossing to isolate and take the causeway were discarded when it was found that the water level was too low for the use of assault boats, but the muddy bottom was too difficult and therefore impassable for an infantry attack. At 1730 hours, a plan for the withdrawal of the Black Watch from the causeway was put into place. As darkness fell, E and D companies were to withdraw back to the starting positions. A would come out when told after that. And C would withdraw to 200 yards from the end of the causeway in view of a planned and heavy artillery barrage which was planned to support the main attack by the Calgarys across the causeway. It's recorded that at 1840 hours, B Company was back in its position, and at 1910, D Company was also out of the line. 
This was with the exception of a party left to assist in the evacuation of C Company's casualties and two signalers to main contact with the Ford Company. In 1930 hours, A Company had passed the tactical headquarters on their way back. In spite of the darkness, the evacuation of the casualties furthest out on the causeway was found to be impossible. As the slightest sound of movement, the enemy plastered the roadway with shells and mortar and MGs firing on fixed lines. At 2030 hours, Brigadier M.J. McGill, commander of 5th Infantry Brigade, called at tactical headquarters and advised that the barrage was scheduled to start at 2340 hours and to last for half an hour, and that the Calgary Highlanders would go through us during it, that us being the Black Watch, and secure a bridgehead to be followed up by the Regiment de Maisonneuve going through at first light. The Black Watch diary entry for October 31st ends. As the month closed, the red fire of Beaufort's laced the dark sky. Mortar shells could be seen bursting on the far bank, and the sound of our heavy artillery was everywhere. E Company of the Calgarys were the first company to move out, and they did so way too early. The War Diary recounted this episode. Captain Clark caused certain consternation when he announced at 2145 hours, his company was on the move. One other company took up the signal and started to green. After a few humorous exchanges on the blower, Major Ellis finally succeeded in halting the column. The explanation was that the men were suffering from sore feet, and it was decided that it would be a help to have them move early and slowly so as to be on the start line on time with a minimum of effort. The earlier difficulties faced on the causeway made its way into the Calgary's war diary. It's noted that the Black Watch, having an unpleasant time all afternoon and night, was thinning out to allow us in. Promptly, at 2340 hours, as per the schedule, the fire program unfolded, and it was quite spectacular. At 2350 hours, Baker Company once again startled its listeners by announcing, Baker Company reports Merry Christmas. The code word Merry Christmas, meaning the attack had begun. Unlike the earlier premature advance, there's no mention of how this one was stopped, as the War Diary continues next. At 2400 hours, Baker Company started out along the causeway, while everyone waited, almost with bated breath, for their first report. After a few administrative things are mentioned, the War Diary for October 31st, 1944, of the Calgary Highlanders ends. More than one remark that Jerry would not forget the Halloween party which the Calgary Highlanders calculated to put on for Jerry's benefit. The initial attack by B Company of the Calgarys failed just like the Black Watch attack. They were hit by German machine gun and mortar fire about halfway down the causeway. A retreat was ordered and a new plan was devised. The next attack took place on November 1st at 0605 hours. The attack was led by D Company of the Calgarys. Our diary reports, in the face of heavy shelling, Dog Company kicked off and determinately and doggedly inched its way. At 06.52 hours, the leading element spotted an extensive roadblock at the end of the causeway. At this time, there was only a small amount of MG fire, but heavy shelling continued. Enemy snipers were quite active too. Despite the crossfire, Dog Company passed the roadblock. To silence enemy guns, already engaged the territory just ahead of Dog Company. Dog Company continued to push its way down the causeway and onto Walker and Island itself. Their war diary reported, at 0830 hours, Dog Company reported no change in enemy opposition and Jerry sniping taking a toll of the company. Artie was once again the solution, and by 0933 hours, Dog Company reported on its objective, that the operation was successful, and that a platoon was working along the dike south of the causeway. Unfortunately for the troops of the Calgarys and the rest of the 5th Brigade, the success was temporary. It was at this point that the first German prisoners of war were being sent back to the Canadian lines. Due to the success of reaching Wilkern Island, it was ordered that more companies were to move through and continue with the advance. A Company and then B Company were put into motion to follow up on the success of D Company. Able Company was able to get onto the island itself and move north towards its objective and only encountered light opposition. B Company made good progress as they moved south of the causeway. C Company started to move towards Walkern Island on the causeway at around 1300 hours. They quickly ran into the tail end of A Company, which was being held up by snipers. It was at this point that things started to unravel. D Company was hit by a German counterattack and was pushed back onto the causeway itself. There is little detail about the counterattacks. B and D Companies were withdrawn from the fighting at this point. A and C Companies took up defensive positions near the cratered area on the causeway and prepared to resist any further German counterattacks. It is at this point in the fighting at the causeway that the last infantry battalion of the 5th Brigade, Le Regiment de Maisonneuve, entered the fighting. Their war diary is short on details, but some personal recollections of the fighting exist, so those will help fill in some holes. The entry for November 2nd records them facing some artillery fire as they move their way up to the front. Their HR for the attack was 0400 hours. Their war diary recorded an RD of 4.2 and 3 inch mortars concentration for 45 minutes gave the Jerry something to remember. During that barrage, our rifle companies made their way along the causeway. 
D Company came close to the end of the causeway, approximately 200 yards. B Company advanced halfway, followed by C Company. In one instance, D Company was completely cut off. At 0500 hours, a British unit, the Glasgow Highlanders, of the British 157th Infantry Brigade, takes over A, B, C, D Company posts. D Company is at the moment in the impossibility to withdraw and encounters heavy shelling, mortaring, and 20mm fire. An entry for the next day, November 3rd, lists D Company is still trying to fight its way back to the concentration area, and it succeeds to withdraw at 1445 hours. They had suffered 12 casualties, some seriously wounded. Guy de Merlis, the commander of number 16 platoon of D Company of the Maisonev, shared his recollections of the causeway fighting many years later. He wrote, It was like entering a giant blast furnace stoked with fireworks. The enemy was not taken by surprise, his firepower not diminished, nor indeed his will to resist. The Maisies ran forward, falling to the ground more by stumbling on the broken up cobblestones than by a wish to find shelter in the water filled shell holes. Moving shadows ahead of us were targeted until it was realized that, unknown to us, some Calgarians were still caught on the causeway. This moment of panic passed, and we resumed our progress. For us, a zigzagging escape forward seemed our best protection. Mazenev attack across the causeway was carried out with such zeal that they moved 500 meters past the entrance to the causeway, well beyond the objective. It was here where they became cut off. Demerlis continued his recollections at this point. Our best protection was a water-filled ditch. For a while, as dawn rose and we shivered from cold and exhaustion and waist-deep water, the war was abnormally quiet. The peace was short-lived. From an opening in the dike some 500 meters south, a 20 millimeter gun on a mobile platform opened fire down the road and through the viaduct. I told Private J.C. Carrier, accompanied by a Belgian volunteer, to wait up the ditch with the Piot to see if he could silence the gun. On their second try, they were successful, and Private Carrier thus earned the military medal. A new threat arose, this time from the north. A German tank was rumbling down the road, heading for the viaduct. Thoughts of becoming a prisoner of war flashed through my mind until, miraculously, a rocket-firing typhoon appeared on the scene. While the tank was not destroyed, it quickly reversed direction. Merlis continued, what was to be a one-hour excursion on Walgren stretched to ten before we got word to withdraw regardless at 1,400 hours. The Merlis recalled the withdrawal back across the causeway. I ensured that the last acknowledged member of my depleted platoon had passed by. One man, Private Fortier, was left behind because of his serious wounds. He was possibly cared for by the Germans before their capitulation, for he died later, having been evacuated to England. My mind numb and physically exhausted, I reached the far end of this miserable causeway, where our company quartermaster was mercifully greeting the survivors. I emptied the cup full of rum he handed to me. He finished his recollections with, In the half century since the operation, many questions have been raised concerning the justification for such attack. The tactics employed, the sensitivity displayed, the nature of Allied cooperation. Such an autopsy, however, is best left to the historians. What is indisputable is the valor displayed by the combatants of the 5th Brigade in the face of the horror they confronted in a military operation that had no name and at the time little fame. Costs for the 5th Canadian Infantry Brigade, the Walkering Causeway were quite high. The Black Watch of Canada suffered 10 killed and 34 wounded during their attack. Calgary suffered the most, with 17 dead and 46 wounded, and the Maisonev suffered 1 dead and 10 wounded. Of course, it was that Allied cooperation that de Merlis has a few issues with in his recollections that brought the fighting for the Walkering Causeway to an end. It took the troops of the British 156th Brigade, who found a path further down the island to cross in boats to help flank German defenders, and allowed the push onto Metalburg from the causeway on Walkeren. Of course, the landings of Operation Infatuate at West Capel and Flushing also played a role in bringing the fighting on the causeway to an end. Like de Merlis has mentioned, there is much controversy over the tactics and the necessity of such fighting at the causeway. It is my belief that such an attack was necessary to pull German attention away from the landings at Flushing and West Capel. These landings were already difficult as it was, so any more German troops in the area would have caused nothing but more problems. Check out this playlist of live streams about the Battle of the Shell, which gives lots of context to the overall battle and how things led to the fighting at Walker and Causeway.